Now, before I get into the meat of this video, I want to explain why OMM in pregnancy is so high yield. Many of you are studying for the OMM section of Comlex, and depending on what resource you're using or what primary literature you're reading, there's really not a whole lot on OMM in pregnancy. And unfortunately, test writers know this. So they can ask you questions about OMM in pregnancy with the understanding that you may have never encountered this information before. And because of that, this is incredibly important to understand. If every student in the country is probably studying the same finite information of OMM for the OMM section of Comlex, if you get a question right that almost every other student in the country wouldn't get, and, and again, you know, USMLE and Comlex, these are national exams. So if you get that one question right that 99% of the population gets wrong, it's going to reflect itself in your score and it's going to help you out immensely. So please know this information. OMM um, and specifically OMM in pregnancy is so high yield for Comlex. So let's get into it. This is not going to be a long video, but there is some stuff that you need to know. Now, OMT during pregnancy improves low back pain and other visceral changes. So think of your classic pregnant patient. What might the complaints be when that patient is in is either coming to the office in real life or is in a question on Comlex? And, and the things that should come to mind are headache, low back pain, difficulty breathing, constipation, right, fatigue, things like that. And all of those complaints can be treated fairly well with OMM. OMT may be perceived as unsafe in the third trimester, but there's actually not been any data to validate that. And we have pretty good evidence, relatively speaking, that OMT in the third trimester is indeed safe. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk about the physiological changes that occur in pregnancy. And as far as Comlex is concerned, the two most high yield ones are going to be mentioned on this slide. First, you get an increased release of relaxin from the 10th to the 12th week. And relaxin has a whole cascade of events where one change physiologically affects the next change physiologically. And it kind of looks like this. So relaxin, as the name implies, relaxes joints. And specifically, it causes pelvic and sacral joint laxity. As those joints become more lax, your pelvis is more free to tilt anteriorly, which is not the normal physiologic position. And as that pelvis tilts anteriorly, the lumbar lordosis becomes accentuated, or it becomes more severe, or it gets worse. And as that lumbar lordosis becomes worse, you, the back muscles become hypertonic. So simply because of the release of this hormone at week 10 to 12, you get joint laxity, which causes pelvic tilt, which causes lumbar lordosis accentuation, which causes somatic dysfunction of back musculature. So you can get pelvic sacral pain, you can get back pain, right? These are all events that are a downstream cascade from the release of relaxin. Now, the other major physiologic change of pregnancy that is especially high yield, particularly on Comlex, maybe not so much necessarily on USMLE, is the increase of progesterone. And progesterone is a vasoactive ingredient, and it causes increased venous congestion. And we'll get into this just a bit more on, a, on the next slide, but you want to know that relaxin and progesterone are the two major hormones that are driving much of the somatic dysfunctions that occur in pregnancy. Now let's get further into this idea of there being hemodynamic changes as a part of pregnancy. What do you expect to see in your pregnant patient? Well, you're going to see increased cardiac output. You're going to see increased sodium retention. You're going to see increased water retention. You're going to see expanding total blood volumes and reduced systemic vascular resistance or SVR. And collectively, the way that you should think about all of these changes, all of these hemodynamic physiologic changes of pregnancy, is that collectively they serve to increase the total fluid volume in the body. So what do we have so far? I want you to see this in your head. Well, we've got a pregnant patient that has increased total fluid volume circ circulating throughout the body. So they're going to be edematous, right? They're going to be puffy and large. 
And that's going to cause a lot of physical pain if that fluid is just hanging out around joints, around muscles, around bones. Now, the problem isn't necessarily that there's an edematous state where there's free fluid expanding throughout the body. It's that in addition to that free fluid being in excess, the body has a hard time returning that fluid and draining it. So the other big idea here is that you see a decreased lymphatic drainage. Now, where that decreased lymphatic drainage comes from is a few items. First, you get a worsening or accentuation of the thoracic kyphosis. And recall that the restriction in the thoracic area is particularly problematic for getting lymph back up to where it needs to drain. In addition, you get diaphragm restriction. And occasionally, you can have fetal compression of the vena cava. So collectively, these three items together serve to decrease lymphatic drainage as lymph tries to move back up to the thoracic outlet area. Okay, so collectively, think about these three things as reducing lymphatic return or drainage. So again, you need to be able to see this in your head. You've got a pregnant patient with increased relaxin and increased progesterone. So relaxin is causing joint laxity, which is allowing all the joints to become so lax that they shift out of position and cause somatic dysfunction. Progesterone being so vasoactive causes a whole host of hemodynamic changes, which pushes free fluid throughout the body. So now you've got this edematous, puffy, overweight, pregnant patient. And to make matters so much worse, if there's ex really bad somatic dysfunction, then that lymph cannot drain back through the thoracic outlet. And therefore, it's just more fluid stuck in the body. So collectively, your patients are going to have visceral changes and somatic symptoms that they need to be treated for. So the question is, do we have good data for OMT in pregnancy? And the answer would be yes. There is a study from 2016 called the PROMOTE study. And what this study looked at was how likely are pregnant patients who receive OMT to transition to high risk status. And the study found that they were no more likely to get into the status if they received OMT. What the study did find is that participants receiving OMT had longer durations of labor than participants in non-OMT groups. And their conclusion from that finding was basically that it needs, um, it, you know, they need to study that or it needs more, more data. Um, and, and lastly, OMT did not change the evaluation frequency of these patients, the medications they were given, their activity level, or the presence of precipitous labor. So the conclusion from this study was basically that OMT is indeed safe in the third trimester. So that's really it for this lesson. The bottom line is that physiologic changes of pregnancy are particularly problematic, especially due to relaxin and progesterone. But we have data that says that OMT in pregnancy is safe. And if you're going to use OMT, you're going to direct it towards the symptom that the patient is experiencing. So what I mean by that is if you get a complex question and the chief complaint is a pregnant patient with a headache, you treat them just like any other patient because again, OMT is safe in pregnancy. So you might do something like suboccipital release. If you get a pregnant patient and their chief complaint is low back pain, you treat their low back pain just like you would treat any other patient, okay? So the actual technique that you pick will be consistent with the technique that you would pick in a normal patient for the most part. So we don't really need to go over that. The bottom line here is remember the physiologic changes. Remember relaxin and progesterone. Those are very, very high yield. And I would know the PROMOTE study. I think you're going to see that more and more on COMLEX as we get more data and more primary literature supporting the use of OMT because that's the direction that these tests are moving.